Can neuroscience help us to better understand and have successful long-term relationships? Keep listening on to find out only here on the People Scientist Podcast. Listening to the People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on neuroscience, physiology, and nutrition. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 119, where every episode I try to make us all a little bit smarter and a little bit healthier. How are you feeling today? How's the body, the mind, the heart feeling? I hope that you're doing okay. If by chance you happen to be feeling overwhelmed, I do have some episodes such as episode 46. 109, and 112 that have some tips for helping us gain control of our emotions and to aim to have better mental well-being. Perhaps right now we even feel like our diet is in a bit of a rut, perhaps? Well, in episode 58 and 59, I aim to give us an understanding as to how our diet can impact our mental well-being, and I also give some neuroscience-based strategies to help us get back on track with healthy eating. But before I jump into today's topic, I have to take a moment to say a very huge thank you to new Patreon patron, Camilo. It means so much to me when all of you reach out to me to say hi, to say thank you for the episode, to let me know how the episode made a positive impact on you, or when you buy me a coffee to say thank you for the show. It means so much to me because sometimes when I feel like I'm doing the podcast, I feel like I'm just speaking to myself. When one of you reaches out to me and does a really thoughtful gesture like that, it means the world to me. You keep me motivated to keep doing this podcast. So thank you so much, Camilo, for being a Patreon patron. And if by chance you want to be a Patreon patron too, the info on how to do that is in the description box to this episode. So what are we going to talk about today? Seeing as it is the month of February and Valentine's Day is around the corner, I wanted to do something relevant. Now, I know some people love Valentine's Day and some people don't like it, but I often think it is fun to discuss the neuroscience and psychology of love and relationships, because love and relationships is something that we've all experienced, right? It is something we can all relate to. And often the science of love is not discussed or well understood. Last year, in episode 91, I discussed the neuroscience of love, but today I'm going to talk about the neuroscience and psychology of romantic relationships. What role does our brain play in this, and can we use neuroscience to our advantage to help us maintain healthy and happy relationships? Well, let's find out. But before we dive into those core takeaways, let's jump into our Foregone Facts segment, where I share an interesting old scientific finding. Vitamin B2 riboflavin was isolated back in 1879 when a chemist named Alexander Winter Blythe noticed a glowing fluorescent yellow color in an isolate of cow milk whey. Now, this is intriguing because have you ever wondered why our urine turns brightly fluorescent yellow when we take a multivitamin supplement? That is because riboflavin vitamin B2 itself is brightly fluorescent yellow. And chances are that supplement that we're taking, the multivitamin, has a lot of riboflavin. So what happens is riboflavin gets absorbed by our intestines It circulates around in our blood, but the transporters can only grab onto so much of the vitamin B2 riboflavin. They can only take so much of it into our tissues before our kidney filters it out and shows up in our urine. As a result, that makes our urine fluorescent yellow. 
But it took scientists several decades to isolate riboflavin and to put it into supplements from its discovery back in 1879. Over the decades, scientists learned that vitamin B2 riboflavin was necessary for our energy metabolism and to repair damage to our DNA, which is very important in reducing the risk of cancer. Now, signs that we may be deficient in vitamin B2 riboflavin include low energy levels, low tolerance to exercise, red and cracked corners of the lips called chelosis, dandruff, and dry skin. Now, do you want to know how they found this out? Well, back then, over 100 years ago, they would recruit some people and give them a diet deficient in a vitamin to see if it was important for our health and survival. And so when someone ate a diet deficient in vitamin B2, these were the symptoms that they developed. Now, it is remarkable to me that nutrition is such a young science, that we only learned about the importance of vitamins in the early to mid-1900s. Now today we can go to many stores to purchase a supplement and deficiencies deficiencies seem to be a thing of the past. So now, how about we jump into today's topic and let's jump into the core takeaways on the neuroscience and psychology of romantic relationships. Now today I will share some psychology and neuroscience-based evidence on how people may choose a romantic partner and what scientists have found for lasting, happy relationships. Scientists have studied love as a way to promote stability and happiness within romantic relationships and family units. Many theories and approaches have been taken in regard to love and romance. For example, scientists have looked at our genetics and how that may play a role in who we choose as a partner and how likely we are to have a lasting relationship. Our chemo signals that alert others to our emotions through our sense of smell. Why we may gravitate romantically toward a certain type of person. How we deal with stress in our relationships. What brain regions are involved in the romantic connection. And how all of these may play a role in our happiness and success of our relationships. Now, if you are not interested in the neuroscience behind how people find a partner, but you're only interested in the neuroscience and psychology of maintaining a long-term healthy relationship, then skip ahead to the 16-minute mark. Now, let's get into those scientific details. So let's start off with the neuroscience and psychology behind why we may gravitate toward particular people for romantic relationships. There was an interesting study conducted by Hish and colleagues in 2010, where they wanted to determine what makes people click. They analyzed dating profile data of nearly 6,500 people in Boston and San Diego to understand what characteristics made people want to engage with one another if there was any pattern or strategy to it. Firstly, they noted that women tended to be more selective and would look at less profiles. They would look at about one-third the number of profiles versus the amount of profiles men looked at. In other words, men looked at three times more profiles than women did. That, firstly, I think is interesting unto itself. Second, the scientists noted that there was no evidence or strategy in choosing who they engaged with. If a pattern did exist, the greatest pattern was that men and women have a strong preference for people with similar attributes to themselves. Like, did they grow up in a similar area, attend similar schools, have a similar level of education, be around the same age? And yes, even if they had similar physical appearances, sometimes that occurred as a pattern too. Now, the concept that we choose people who may have some physical similarity to us is intriguing. Berzecki in 2009 wrote of social imprinting that we simply associate certain feelings of comfort, intimacy, or love with people who may look similar to those we grew up around. Whether that be people around us like our family and friends, people at school, people we see on TV or online, that to a certain extent we may be conditioned to want to date someone that looks a certain way, a certain type, because we associated positive feelings with individuals that looked that way when we grew up. And sometimes that means that we look for individuals that may have similarities to ourselves. Now, what else might play a role in how we choose a partner? Our sense of smell might also play a role in choosing a partner. 
we are appreciating that communication can be beyond words and body language and physical appearance. That we as humans can emit certain molecules in our sweat that may be detected by others around us. In animals, these molecules emitted that can be smelled are called pheromones, but in humans, they are called chemosignals. Chemosignals transmitted through body odors may play a role in the communication in humans, and even between humans and other species like dogs and cats. Now, oftentimes in clinical trials, participants can't even notice a scent per se, but the chemosignals can still result in a physiological response, such as increased alertness, hair standing on end, increased sensitivity to emotions, and brain region recruitment. Interestingly, scientists have realized that through many clinical trials, women seem to be more sensitive to chemosignals than men. It is also clear that chemosignals from individuals of the opposite gender are more effective and powerful than those of the same gender. So women perceive the scent of men more accurately, and men of women. Martins in 2005 concluded that therefore chemosignals likely serve an evolutionary purpose in finding a mate for reproductive purposes. But, if is that true in today's world, we're not certain. Wisman and Shira in the journal Archives of Sexual Behavior last year conducted a clinical trial where they took sweat samples from women when they were aroused and when they were not. So how did they do this, you might be wondering. Well, they had 11 heterosexual young women join the study. The scientists had the women refrain from using perfume and from eating strong foods for days prior and to clean their underarms with unscented wipes. Then they had placed cotton pads under their arms. The women were to cycle on a stationary bike for three minutes, then watched a neutral video about bridge building, or on another day watched a video that would have them become aroused, and this movie was called Nine Songs. The women were asked to rate how they felt when watching the two different movies, and how aroused they felt. The cotton pads were then taken and provided to 24 heterosexual men. The men were asked to rate how attractive they found the scents and how intensely they felt about it. Now, interestingly, the men did indeed rate the scent of women when aroused as far more attractive and pleasant versus when women watched the neutral videos. Now, how about a scent that a man might give off? How about testosterone? Can we sense or smell testosterone? Possibly. Testosterone is converted to an odorous compound called androstadienone. Both women and men can emit this molecule, but men naturally emit far more. This compound is known to modulate mood, dominance, and may make us feel more alert. Now, Saxton in the journal Hormones and Behavior in 2008 studied the influence of androstadienone, commonly emitted in the sweat of men and sometimes women, on how attractive women perceived men to be. So the scientists tested the effects of this compound at a speed dating event in which men and women interacted in a series of brief encounters. Women smelled either this compound, clove oil, or water prior to the dating event. Men rated about 19% more attractive when assessed by women who had been exposed to androstadienone versus water. So the scientists suggested that this compound, this metabolite of testosterone, that can be emitted from men's sweat may be able to influence women's attraction to men when interacting with them for the first time. So our sense of smell may just play a role in who we gravitate toward, or it may influence our interaction with others. Now, what brain areas may regulate this? Zeki in 2007 concluded that using fMRI studies in humans, brain areas that show activation in romantic love are the medial insula, anterior cingulate cortex, hippocampus, striatum, nucleus accumbens, and hypothalamus. Now, many of these brain regions are very important and are part of the brain reward system and all contain high concentrations of dopamine. But at the same time, several cortical regions, including the amygdala, frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, and temporal lobes are inhibited. Interesting, isn't it? It could explain why some say love is blind or love makes us do stupid things. Our thinking, decision-making, memory brain regions seem to be less active and inhibited when people are newly in love, whereas the pleasure and reward brain regions are more active when newly in love. That neurobiology helps explain some behavior when people are newly in love, doesn't it? Now, how about another theory on love and relationships? There is this hypothesis called the tie-up theory. Now, unfortunately, a lot of these studies and these theories have only been studied in the context of heterosexual couples, 
but hopefully these studies can be replicated and studied in the context of other couples too. Now in this theory, they posit that at the very beginning of choosing whether or not to engage or pursue a person, that surprisingly women put more emphasis on physicality and men put more emphasis on psychological and social characteristics. They hypothesize that women innately and subconsciously want to know if a man may be a good mate, a good provider. Do they have the physicality to do so? Do they appear to have good genetics should we choose to have kids? That even if we don't want to have kids, or even if we take care of ourselves very independently, this innately still may be a subconscious evolutionary response in our brain. In contrast, men may very initially want to know if a woman has the psychological prowess, the openness, stability, or skills to be a good partner in a relationship, perhaps if they can intellectually stimulate them, understand them, be a good companion, support them, and if they can be trusted. They want to know if the time and effort that they put into the relationship will be worth it. But then, intriguingly, in this theory, over time, as the relationship forms and turns from short-term into long-term, Where emphasis or importance is placed, reverses, with the importance of physicality of a man for a woman becomes less important, and the psychological and social skills of a man becomes more important. With time, vice versa, the physicality of a woman becomes more important for a man. Now, this theory might contradict what a lot of us initially thought, but it may very well be true for some. So what this theory proposes is initially responding to someone you meet When choosing to engage with them, women may very initially place more importance on physicality, where men may place more importance on social and psychological skills of the woman, but that reverses as time goes on. Intriguing theory, isn't it? What do you think? Do you think that is true, or do you think it is totally wrong? Theories are meant to be challenged and questioned, so I always love hearing your thoughts on what I share. Okay, so now that I've covered some science on choosing a partner, Let's talk about relationships. Psychologists speculate that there are three phases of love. The first phase they have coined as being in love. Kind of a funny title, but they simply just called this phase being in love. It is characterized by a rise in stress hormones in the blood like cortisol and vasopressin, but also a rise in dopamine brain region activity. Because this is a time of uncertainty, but as well as euphoria, excitement, and intimacy. This initial phase is thought to last around six months. The second phase is called passionate love. The feelings of excitement and euphoria decline and now are replaced with stability and balance. Levels of intimacy and commitment increase. Stress hormones that were higher during the first six months have now dropped. This phase tends to last around a few years, but some couples remain in this phase for a much longer period of time. Now, the third phase is the phase where many couples may, unfortunately, break up. This tends to happen around the four-year mark. So some psychologists have said that the coined seven-year itch where couples tend to drift apart actually tends to happen earlier and have now coined it the newly termed four-year itch. This third phase of love, if couples make it this far, is called companionate love. This phase is quite similar to friendship, where passion declines, but intimacy and commitment remain high. Oxytocin is thought to be the main hormone involved here, which is involved in bonding and attachment. If commitment is high enough between two people, the relationship can successfully last in this phase. So now let's talk about the psychology of having a successful relationship. Years ago, scientists studied love as a way to promote stability within marriages and families. They originally thought that with more conflict, there was less love that conflict was the enemy to love. But psychologists since then have disproven this. Houston in 2001 reported that the greatest predictor of love and successful romantic relationships seems to instead be signs of positive affect, like eye contact, cuddling, and positive remarks about each other. These are signs of affection, admiration, and bonding, which can be foundational in a romantic relationship. So placing emphasis on physical acts of affection, bonding, and admiring one another may make a very large impact on a relationship's longevity. Gulage in the American Journal of Family Therapy in 2003 investigated the importance of physical affection on the ability for couples to resolve conflict and to be able to have a happy relationship. 
Now, this study excluded sexual intimacy in its analysis. It looked specifically at physical affection, including massages, caressing, cuddling, holding hands, hugging, kissing on the lips, and kisses on the face. The scientists had 295 people fill out a detailed questionnaire on their physical affection preference, tendencies, and relationship details. The scientists noted that physical affection in general was indeed associated with partner satisfaction, better conflict resolution, and relationship happiness. It did not correlate to the amount of conflict, though. So, for example, a physically affectionate couple may still have a lot of conflict. However, if they are very physically affectionate, they appear to be able to resolve the conflict more effectively than couples that don't show as much physical affection. Now, keep in mind this is a correlation and not a causation. Certain types of physical affection were more significantly associated with relationship happiness. This included massages, caressing, cuddling, hugging, and kisses on the lips or face. Now, this is intriguing, as the data suggests an important role of physical affection in relationship success. I think we always knew romantic relationships often involved these characteristics, but did we appreciate how important they were in regard to conflict resolution and relationship success? I didn't. However, again, it is important to note that this study is correlation. Physical affection does not necessarily result or cause a happy relationship. It might indicate a sign of a happy relationship, but not necessarily a direct contributor. Now, what do you think? Is or was the amount of physical affection in your relationships a sign of how well your relationships have been going? Now, let's talk about the possible role of our genetics and the likelihood for a successful and happy relationship. The scientists posited, why do some individuals become dissatisfied with their marriages when levels of negative emotion are high? and levels of positive emotions are low, whereas others remain unaffected. In other words, in stressful times, some people are miserable and want to break up or get out of their relationship, whereas in some difficult times, others appear more resilient and unaffected and want to remain in the relationship. Hass and colleagues in the journal Emotion in 2013 aimed to find out why this was. So they recruited 74 married couples aged 40 to 70 years old. They followed these couples for 13 years to determine their level of satisfaction in the relationship. The scientists also added genetic testing for the participants to see if there were any correlations between their genes and the likelihood for a happy marriage. Happy marriage being identified as still being married, content in the relationship, able to resolve conflicts, signs of affection, etc. The scientists also scored the participants' emotional behavior during a 15-minute conflict conversation that was scored by experts. So when looking at these three things, their genetics, their marital success, and their emotional behavior, what did the scientists find? Well, they really honed in on this one gene called 5-HTTLPR. This gene encodes a protein responsible for serotonin transportation. Now, serotonin in our brain is incredibly important for our mood stability. Serotonin is often the target to improve mood. For example, many antidepressant medications aim to increase the amount of serotonin in the synaptic cleft, leaving serotonin active for a longer period of time in our brain. So what did the scientists find out about this gene involved in serotonin? Well, they realized that 5-HTTLPR had some variations to it. Now, these are called alleles. So let me briefly explain the concept of genetic alleles. Let's say we all have the same book. Let's say it is the story Cinderella. But let's say my page 26 is different from your page 26. Let's say it is the part of the story where Cinderella loses her slipper. Maybe in my book, she doesn't lose her glass slipper. And in your book, she still does. Now, does that one page difference change the outcome of the story? Well, sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Maybe the prince still finds her, even though that part of our story is different. But maybe he never finds her because he doesn't have her glass slipper. This is an analogy for what scientists try to do. See, they look at our genetic differences, our alleles, and try to determine if they impact our behavior or health. You see, we all have 
a genetic code, but sometimes we have small differences, like small differences in the pages of our book. But what scientists want to know is, does that change the outcome of our story? Does that change the outcome of our health? Does our page 26 impact our outcome? So the scientists noted that this group of people had different page 26s for their story, meaning different alleles for their gene 5-HTTLPR. So did it change the outcome of their story? It appeared to be related, yes. The scientists noted that in people with a particular difference in their gene, 5-HTTLPR, they had higher negative and lower positive emotional behavior, as well as declines in marital satisfaction over time, even if the scientists controlled for depression or other mood disorders. The scientists noted that individuals with this genetic difference or genetic allele tended to be more easily influenced by stressful situations, that they showed negative emotions like anger, impatience, and aggression, and a lack of emotional control in stressful situations. This seemed to result in negative mood and less satisfaction in their relationships. So what does this mean? Well, if you or your partner are the type to display negative emotions in stressful situations, does that mean that we're doomed to have unhappy relationships? No, not necessarily. The scientists suggest that in relationships where one or more of us are like this, that we can't handle stressful situations very well, a good approach could be to laugh at the situation, to be goofy, to make light of it. That this approach appears to often be very effective in alleviating the negative mood in these situations. Now let me give an example. Let's say our partner is getting stressed before a flight because They can't fit everything in their suitcase, and they are getting flustered because they don't know what to do, and flying in general puts them in a bad mood. We could approach it with somewhat a goofy and lighthearted mood. For example, we could take their suitcase and try sitting on it and laughing together while trying to close it. As scientists, we like to say that our genetics are not our destiny, that we can use our genetics to help understand ourselves better. And that that should be empowering because once we have that information, it gives us a target and now it gives us the power to learn how to work with it in order to be happy and in order to be healthy. Lastly, I want to talk about emotional intelligence. Many times conflicts may arise because of a lack of emotional communication and therefore a lack of understanding and empathy between two people. Now, I go into detail about emotional intelligence in episode 57, if you want to go back and give that a one a listen. Now, there is a technique that I think could be really useful in relationships and just in general called affect labeling. This technique can be very beneficial in helping us gain control of our emotions and to help communicate clearly with our partner so as to induce empathy and avoid conflict. This technique harnesses the fact that the logical part of our brain can inhibit the emotional reactive part of our brain. So our prefrontal cortex of our brain is our higher order brain region. It is highly developed in humans versus all other species. It is partially what sets us apart from other animals. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for our higher order thinking, like decision making, memorization, planning, fluid intelligence, like taking in information and creating new information from that. This higher order brain region, the prefrontal cortex, can inhibit our emotional reactive brain regions like the amygdala. So the more logical approach we take to something, the more likely we can reduce our emotional reactions. Costa Freda and colleagues published a meta-analysis in the journal Brain Research Reviews that pooled together 385 different clinical studies to support this notion. Now, fMRI studies or functional magnetic resonance imaging will give us insight into which brain regions are being recruited in response to certain things, like when we're feeling angry, sad, happy, for example. Well, the scientists would induce certain emotions in the participants in these clinical trials, like happiness or anger, by looking at certain images or watching certain videos. And at the same time, their brains would be scanned using fMRI to detect the blood flow, meaning the brain region recruitment. In many of the studies, brain regions like the amygdala, the mid-hypothalamus, and periaqueductal gray would be recruited in response to the emotions. Then the scientists tried the technique of affect labeling. So affect labeling means we stop and think and ask ourselves, what emotion am I feeling right now? And we need to be specific. That's important. Not just, I feel upset. But what is the emotion? I feel jealous, I feel aggressive, I feel overwhelmed. 
then we can next ask, why do I feel this way? These questions are intended to help reduce the activity of our emotional brain regions and to instead bring on board our logical brain regions. Now let me give an example. I want to give an example of jealousy as sometimes jealousy can be a negative factor in relationships. Let's say we are with our partner at a party. Let's say we pride ourselves on being funny and having a great sense of humor and making our partner be able to laugh. Now, if someone new who you've never met is at the party and they happen to be really funny and they make our partner laugh a lot. Our partner even says, you are the funniest person I've ever met to this new person. And all of a sudden we start feeling a certain kind of way, not a good way. Now, the typical reaction to us feeling jealous is social aggression. This can manifest as ignoring someone, being rude to someone, talking badly about someone behind their back, picking a fight, etc. We may initially choose to respond to the situation by being quiet, maybe sulk a little bit, or even ignore our partner or this new person. Now on the way home, maybe perhaps we even get into a fight with our partner that we don't feel comfortable telling them that we felt jealous in the situation. Now, how could we respond to this in a different way? We could use neuroscience to approach it differently. Let's say if we initially felt this, this negative feeling. Let's take a deep breath instead and use the technique of affect labeling. Let's ask ourselves, what exactly am I feeling? Okay, I've narrowed it down. I'm feeling jealous right now. Next, why do I feel this way? After thinking about it some time, perhaps because I like being able to make my partner laugh, it makes me feel valuable in the situation, and now I feel threatened and not special because this new person is even funnier. Now instead of that typical response to jealousy of social aggression, I propose that we can take the direction of self-improvement. How about we choose to be friends with this new funny person because clearly we appreciate a good sense of humor. Perhaps we can learn from this new person on how to be even funnier by spending time with them. Perhaps we can even look at ourselves and ask how we can improve in other aspects of our life to be an even better, more valuable partner so we feel less threatened. Like we can also improve our listening skills, our thoughtfulness, our spontaneity. Surely our sense of humor is not our only strength. So should we really feel jealous about this aspect? So at the party... When we feel this way, we can either choose to embrace the situation and take the path of self-improvement, or if we felt the need to, we can now clearly communicate to our partner how we felt. For example, I felt jealous because. Now, this technique of affect labeling can be very effective in stressful times to promote clear communication in our relationships, as well as to help us gain control of our emotions, to have that emotional intelligence, and to constantly aim for self-improvement. Now, the intriguing thing about this technique of affect labeling is that it does the opposite with positive emotions. We feel a positive emotion, like feeling happiness or excitement, that when we use affect labeling and identify, I feel happy because it can actually enhance our feelings of happiness. So it goes back to one of those foundations that psychologists have identified in happy romantic relationships is admiration for our partner. And affect labeling might be able to help with that. We can take moments to identify our positive emotions and say, I feel happy right now because, and say that to our partner. And that may also aid in better communication in our relationships. So if you want more details on that, you can go back to episode 57. So that is a wrap, my people scientist army, the neuroscience and psychology of finding love and staying in a long-term happy relationship. Many factors play a role in us choosing a partner, such as our past and the concept of social imprinting, similarity to ourselves and our lifestyle, chemo signals and our sense of smell, physicality and psychological characteristics like openness, intelligence, and stability. Now, many factors play a role in successful long-term relationships, such as our genetics, but remember our genetics are not our destiny. Our emotional intelligence and our physical affection seem to be important in maintaining those long-term healthy relationships too. I hope that this episode was useful and interesting for all of you. If I gave some useful information, even just one of you out there listening, then I am a happy scientist. 
as that is my goal for all of us to be a little bit smarter and healthier and happier with every episode. So if you by chance want to buy me a coffee to say thank you for the episode, my Patreon and Venmo is in the description box to this show. You can also follow me on social media where I share some of the most important papers I cite in each episode as well. I hope that you all have a wonderful and happy week, and I look forward to meeting you back here next time, same time and same place on the People Scientist Podcast. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates. Thank you.